Lord. You're listening to the Jewel City Podcast. To help us spread the gospel of Jesus, give us a five-star rating. That'll help others find this podcast. In this podcast, we'll hear a message from Pastor Robert. Doing things a little different this morning. I ask him just to open up with a couple songs and then we'll end out the service with some praise and some worship this morning. Uh, we're going to pass around a clipboard. Uh, this uh, special service that we're honoring uh, the 9-11, 20 years, uh, on September 12th, uh, we're going to have a special service. You've seen the video, and what we're passing around is for any and all first responders in any area, if you would sign that, if you would like to eat dinner with us, lunch that day after the church service, we would love to have you. Uh, we can't do the whole group. I'm expecting maybe a thousand people that day. So uh, let's stand uh, for the reading of the word. And, and I, I didn't know whether to mention this or, or not, but I, I feel like I, I need to. I've tried to live an open book and um, I'll be honest with you in everything in my life. Um, since April, I've been having a lot of stomach issues and uh, they've run every test they can imagine. So I, m I know my demeanor is not normal this morning. I don't feel like I'm just bubbling over. Uh, it's been a long night and I've been walking the floors throughout the night and they've not been able to find out. I think I know what it is. And, uh, but uh, I've got a rib that keeps dropping out of place and causing me some grief. So it has been a long night, but it's not going to affect my praise. And I love the Lord. And I'll tell you, man, the last 15 minutes, I had a meeting this morning. And then after the board left my office, the last 15 minutes standing at the window or, or so watching everyone pour in the parking lot. Uh, it just humbles me. It humbles me. And God is so good. And he is so worthy of our praise. Even when we don't feel like praising God, he is still worthy. And our praise brings down strongholds and changes the atmosphere. So pastor's not mad at nobody today. It's just been a long evening. So this morning, uh, I want to teach. I want to take my time. And, and, and sometimes it's hard. You've heard the saying, it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks. Look at your neighbor and say, old dog, get ready to learn some new tricks. Last Sunday morning, uh, to be honest with you, I felt like a cheerleader. I felt like uh, I had to kind of encourage everybody to praise. And I've never, uh, I just want to talk for a couple moments. I, I've never needed somebody to encourage me uh, to bring out the gratitude that is in me to my Father in heaven that brought me out of the darkness as we just sang about into the light. I've never needed somebody to jack me up so to speak. Uh, I understand his value. I know what he means to me. I know what he's worth to me. I know that the breath that is in my lungs comes from God and I don't need in my truck when I'm by myself, when I'm in my prayer closet, when I was laying over there yesterday morning praying, I didn't have a praise team. I didn't have nobody to jack me up because I know the word of God and the word said he inhabits the praise of his people. And I know even when I don't feel good, when when things don't look good, when things aren't going right, he is still worthy of my praise. Does anybody know what I'm talking about this morning? So the title of the message is the language, the language of praise. And I don't know, I, 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 shut up, Robert. Deuteronomy six and four. Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart. Do you love him with all your heart? Then you ought to praise him. You ought to praise him. You know, when you're children, you love your children with all your heart. And you, you praise them. 
Then you chastise them when they don't do right. (laughs) And with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Teach them. I told a staff the other day I've really never mentored the staff, like sitting down one-on-one, I kind of try to mentor them by the way I live my life. But God has directed me to be able to, in a season now, to attempt to mentor and to teach and to train them. And, and I got to thinking about with my own children, I maybe failed in the area of actually sitting down, teaching what the Word says And I relied more on watch how dad lives his life. And I think it's a good thing, but it could be out of balance either way. You understand what I'm saying? So, and thou shalt teach them diligently, teach diligently unto thy children. And thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thy house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and while thou risest up. Pastor Aaron, would you bless the reading of the Word of God this morning? Dear Heavenly Father, you are our God. You are our strength and our rock. Father, we come humbly before you today, Lord God. Lord, Psalms 47 says, with, with a clap of praise and a voice of triumph, Lord God. Father, we come, Lord God, I felt a presence of worship whenever I walked through the door this morning. Lord, we love you with all of our heart. Lord, maybe we don't draw out the way that we should, our worship and our praise. But Lord, put that in our spirit, man, Lord God. Let us hear the word of the Lord today, Lord God. Let our language be of praise, Lord God. Let us exalt you and magnify you. Let us lift you up today, Lord. Lord, we just ask you to settle down in the sanctuary with us. Help us to learn of your word today, Lord God. Ask your blessing all over, Pastor. Lord, I saw him writing fresh man of the day, Lord God, as he continued to study this morning. Lord, let us hear the bread of life and receive it in the name of Jesus. And amen. You may be seated this morning. God is, go ahead, go ahead, give God a hand clap of praise this morning. God makes it very clear that his word is what we need to teach our children. Very clear. And God gives us a word about praise, and we're going to get there in a little while. And I I want you to hear this this morning. In most cases, in many cases, we are raising a generation who do not know the language of God or the language of the Holy Spirit. And, And as I thought about that earlier this morning, we are raising a generation, so it sounds like I'm blaming it on this generation, but maybe we need to go back to our generation, and we really don't understand the language of God. So if we don't understand the language of God, we can't teach the language of God and the language of the Holy Spirit to our own children. Do you understand what I'm saying? Most have adopted the language of the culture instead of being taught the language of prayer and the language of praise. And I have chosen the language of praise to speak about today. And prayer and praise, uh, that language will pull down strongholds in our lives. Uh, And whether you want to admit it or not, we are in a battle. We are in a cultural battle and we had better understand the language of prayer and the language of praise to bring down the strongholds or we will be defeated as we already heard if God be for us who can be against us so if you've got the word and the language of God in your spirit you can speak to God through praise and the atmosphere will change and the strongholds will come down if you believe that give God a hand clap and a shout of praise 2 Corinthians 10 and 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We, like Paul, are merely weak humans, but we don't need to use human plans and human methods uh, to win our battles and to bring down our strongholds, and we have a, a, a weapon in praise. Do you hear me? 
We've got a weapon. God's mighty weapons are available to us to fight against Satan, the enemy, and the strongholds that are in our lives. Somebody say praise is a weapon. We cannot allow the devil to silence the word of God in our homes, the word of God in our homes. We are to teach in our homes. It's not my job to teach your children just on Sunday mornings. It's not the Sunday school teachers just to teach your children on Sunday morning. The Bible, Moses said, you need to talk about it in your home. You need to talk about it when you're walking. You need to talk about it when you're lying down. You need to train them up. You need to teach them. And then when they come to the house of God, then they get the gravy, so to speak, on top of the mashed potatoes. Somebody like mashed potatoes and gravy, you ought to shout right there and give God a hand clap and a shout of praise. God's mighty weapons, they're available to you and I. You can't allow the devil to silence the word of God in your home. And Nehemiah encountered this same issue in Jerusalem. The people of God had broken the covenant of God and they had lost their language. If you hear nothing else today, you need to hear, do not lose your language. And the city was nearly destroyed as a result. And when Nehemiah arrived to begin rebuilding, there was only a small remnant of people left. And in those days, Jews had married women of Ashdod and Ammon and Moab. They were mixed marriages, and when I say mixed marriages, meaning God's people had married unbelievers. Half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod and could not speak the language of Judah, but spoke the language of one of the other people. Half the children of God, half, could not speak Hebrew, the very language of God's Word. Just allow me a couple minutes and I'll get where we're going. I want you to listen to Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 23. In those days also I saw Jews uh, that had married wives of Ashdod and of Ammon and of Moab, and their children spake half in the speech of Ashdod and could not speak in the Jews' language, but according to the language of each people. And when you read on, you see that Nehemiah became enraged because of the loss of their language. You and I ought to be enraged because of our children, the loss of their language. And I'll I'll explain what I mean here in a few moments. Uh, This meant the people of God was losing their culture because they had lost their language of their forefathers. You want to know why we in America are in a battle and we are losing our culture because our children do not know their language, cannot speak the language of heaven, and that is through prayer and through praise. Uh, We need to get our praise on and we need to speak to God and take our culture back. Somebody give God a hand clap and a shout of praise. The same thing as happened in Nehemiah's day is happening in the Christian homes today. There's a generation being raised that can't speak the spiritual language of our forefathers. The culture of our time has become their first language. I'll say it again, the culture of our time has become this generation's first language. Why? Why? Because we are exposing our children to more of the culture of the world instead of the culture of heaven. We want to bring the world into the church. We want to chase everything that the world has to offer. Isn't it amazing you get no training when you have kids? You don't get a book when the baby shows up. And I wish I could step back right now in time. There's some things I would do different. So you need to hear me, young moms and dads. And don't wait till you're almost 60 to change it. We are in a battle. We are in a culture battle. And they don't mind standing up and fighting. And we need to stand up and fight. And they are not our enemy. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Our battle is spiritual. And we need to get our praise on and watch God show up and change the atmosphere. (laughs) Parents, the next generation will never speak what we don't speak. The next generation will not participate in what we don't participate on Sunday mornings. Do you understand what I'm saying? We'll never, they will never do what we don't do. This thought came to my mind this morning and I have shared it a few times. That's a private joke right there. 
I can remember when my oldest boy, and I, I think he's 38, he might be 39, I don't know. But he was just young, and we were deer hunting, and there was snow. And I looked back, and his little legs, he was trying to walk in my footprints. What kind of foot, footprints are you leaving in the house of God during worship for your children to fall into? We must speak God's word every day in our homes so that it becomes the most familiar language to our children. Do you hear me? As always, Jesus is our model. It's very simple. He's our model. He spoke only what he heard his father speak. Your children will speak what you speak. Your children will worship like you worship. They will follow your lead. John 12 and 49. He said, for I have not spoken of myself, but the father which have sent me. He gave me a commandment. What should I say and what should I speak? He knew the power of God's word. Do you hear me? Jesus knew the power of God's word. And there is God's instruction, God's instruction, God's word tells us how to praise, how to get in the presence of God. And it's not something that's hard to do. You just got to follow the instructions. That's how he resisted the devil in the wilderness. Every time the devil tried to tempt him, Jesus responded with the scripture. You and I got to stand firm, refusing to allow Satan to choke out God's word out of your home. We got to refuse to allow God, Satan to choke out the praise in God's house. This is God's house. This is God's day. And the devil wants to choke out your praise. Do you hear what I'm saying? Let God's word, the language of praise, always be on your lips. Always. Not just in the house of God, but I'll tell you, if you can't get a praise on here, I, I kind of question if you can get a praise on somewhere else. If you can't get a praise on in the house of God with anointed worship and brothers and sisters in Christ getting together and the presence of God dropping like dew out of heaven, then I kind of question if you can get a praise on anywhere else. I just wonder if God has done anything for anybody that you could get undignified for about 30 seconds and get a praise on. Get a praise on. Get a praise on. I'm tired of being a cheerleader. He's a cheerleader. Amen. He's worthy of our praise. Woo! Listen to me. Praise. He brings his presence. Somebody say praise the Lord. Somebody say act like you mean it. Say praise the Lord. Pastor Kerry knew what direction I was going this week, and she handed me a book this week and had a bookmark in a certain chapter that she had taught the praise team and the choir and everybody. And there was a few things I wrote down. It says, praise is an expression of respect or gratitude as an act of worship. Let me read it again. Praise is an expression of respect. When you enter into God's house, you ought to have a praise because you've got an attitude of respect because you know who you are approaching. You are not approaching these people here. You are not approaching me. You are coming into the Holy of Holies and you are approaching God Almighty. And it doesn't qualify. It does not smell right to, to have a half-hearted half praise on when you enter into the presence of Jehovah God Almighty. He is worthy, worthy, worthy of everything that we've got to offer him. Worship begins, the book said, worship begins with a motivation of loving and honoring God. And that motivation must, listen to what it says, have expression. And praise is one of the expressions that completes the act of worship. Praise will bring down strongholds in your life. It will change your life. Listen to what David said in Psalms 9 and 1, I will praise thee, O Lord. And then he said, with my whole heart. And then he said, I will show forth all thy marvelous works. He said, I'm going to lift you up and I'm going to praise you and I'm going to show forth all your marvelous works. 
So again, praise must be an expression. Many have been trained by bad theology and denominational culture that it is perfectly okay for us to stand with our arms closed, with our hands in our pocket, and our mouth closed during worship. Can I tell you, that is a lie from the devil. Do you hear me? It is amazing when your favorite team scores a touchdown. Your favorite team wins a three-point shot at the buzzer. Your favorite team can hit a grand slam and you can do the hokey pokey and get all excited and clap your hands when you win a ball game. But when we walk in to the house of God, we just close our arms. We just shut our mouth. We just stick our hands in our pocket and say, God, God, bless me if you can. Can I tell you, you ought to lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. Somebody give him a hand clap and a shout of praise. Praise. Somebody say praise. It's got to include expression. Praise is expressing to God our appreciation and our understanding of his worth. And I know inside of me, I know what he's worth. And when I praise, I'm telling him how I appreciate you, how thankful I am that not just on April 10th when I had, I've been praising God since the day I got saved. I'm telling you, and I want it to get better and better, gooder and gooder, however you want to look at it, because he's, he's walked with me through the storm. He'd been there when I was sick. He'd been there when I went through a divorce. He'd been there in the middle of the night when nobody else was around. He was there when mom died. He was there when dad died. He was there when my kids were going crazy. He is God almighty, and I understand his value to me, and I appreciate him, and I just pray that we can grab a hold of that in our spirit today and it would change the atmosphere in our own lives. Whoa! You know what I want you to do? I want you to stand with me. I want you to stand and it's going to be a while. I want you to stand as I preach right now. If you realize how good God is and how worthy he is, put your hands together and give him a praise. Bless the Lord. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. First Peter two and nine. Stand with me, unless you unless you ain't, you're not able to, then sit down. We'll talk about you later. First Peter two and nine. Listen to me. Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. That's who you are. And every man in this building that is married, you are the priest of your household. You'll get them to the ball game on time, but you won't get them to church on time. You'll get them to the ball game on time, but you won't get them to VBS at all. You won't come to a youth meeting with your children. You are not being the example, the priest in your house that God, they ought to see their dad say, hey, you got to get in the car. We got to get there. It's important. It is more valuable than anything else you can do with your children. And then they ought to see dad in the car with Caleb on or his worship, his praise on. You ought to be the leader in your row. When your family comes in here, you ought to have your hands up. You ought to be blessing the Lord. I'm going to amen. I'm going to come on too. Praise must be an expression. Do you hear me? You are chosen people that you should what? Show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of the darkness into the light. You ought to say, hey, Father, I want to bless you. I want to praise you. You ought to let everybody around you know that your praise is because your Father brought you out of the darkness, brought you out of Egypt, put you into the light, into the promised land. Into the promised land. You may be feeling admiration in your heart, but how are you expressing it to God and to the world? You say, well, I'll sit here in the pew and I'm just, I got admiration in my heart and I'm just bubbling over. Then let it bubble. Let it bubble. Now here's something, listen, and I find this amazing. 
King David thought he knew how to get more of God's presence. He thought his plan of bringing the ark, the presence of God back home, was better than God's instruction. And I don't think it's any different than when we come into God's house and we sit there with our hands in our pocket, our arms closed. We got this mentality that I know more than you do, God. I know more than you are instructing me to. And I'll get to his instructions in a little while. First Chronicles 13 and 9, we look at David. And when they came unto the threshing floor of Shaddon, Shaddon, Uzzah put forth his hand to hold the ark. And the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and he smote him, because he put his hand to the ark. And there he died before God, and David was displeased, because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah. Wherefore, that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. I got Uzzah, Uzzah all over my tongue. And David was afraid of God that day, and he said, how shall I bring the ark of God home to me? So David brought not the ark home to himself, to the city of David, but carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. Now listen, and the ark of God remained with the family, with the family of Obed-Edom in his house three months. And the Lord blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that he had. You read on, it's the only place that talks about Obed-Edom, and uh, I believe he had eight sons. Uh, None of them were hooked on crack. None of them were hooked on uh, pornography. None of them was alcoholics or bitter. They were all blessed because the presence of God was in their home. It starts in your home. Somebody say amen. amen. So listen to me. Here's the story of King David's attempt to bring God's presence back to his people, the Israelites. While David's intentions were good, and many people's intentions are good when they come to the house of God, but we fall short because my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And you're getting the knowledge today. While David's intentions were good, he made the mistake of disrupting God's plan to how the ark should be moved. The ark was always to be carried upon the shoulders of men, and David decided to load an ox drawing cart instead. I say he got lazy. That's what I say, he got lazy. And the ox stumbled. One of David's men named Uzzah put his hand on it to stabilize it. None of the holy things of God during this time were to be touched, and there was a penalty of death, and Uzzah was struck dead. So upset and frightened, David decided not to bring home the ark, the presence of God. Why don't you have the presence of God? Or we should have, I don't wanna wanna single nobody out, but if you don't have the presence of God in your house, if the only time you're talking about God and having church is in the church, something's wrong. Something's wrong. Listen to me, David left the ark at the humble man's heart, a home named Obed-Edom. Look at your neighbor, say neighbor. Aren't you glad your name ain't Obed-Edom? <laughs> and the ark of God remained with the family of Obed-Edom in his house three months, and the Lord blessed the house of Obed-Edom all the days. When you come from your home, and the Lord laid this in my spirit, when you come from your home, and you enter into your row, you represent your family. You represent your whole family. You represent the Hamrick family. You represent the Deitzel family and around the room. You represent, you are a chosen, you are a royal priesthood. And you represent, when you come into the house of God, you ought to say the Shingleton family is here and we come to praise you. Let everything that have breath praise ye the Lord. Give him a hand clap and a shout of praise. We don't live in Old Testament times. Jesus died on the cross. The veil has been rent from top to bottom. You have access. You don't need just a priest once a year to go in for the atonement of your sins. God desires that we draw close to Him at all times, and one of the ways is through praise. God is saying, it's time to take me home with you. Just like 
Obed-Edom took my presence home with him and I blessed him. It's time for each family here at Jewel City Church not to leave me here when you leave on Sunday morning. It's time you get serious and take me home. And just like I blessed Obed-Edom, I bless you and your household. If you believe God is able to do it, give him a hand clap. There is a great day of spiritual dryness in America. Spiritual dryness in our homes, and sad to say, spiritual dryness in our churches. And America desperately needs the reign of the Holy Spirit. And God wants you and I to be a rain maker. And we ought to get our rain dance on. Do you hear what I'm saying? Praise and worship are the language of heaven. You don't like praise, you don't like worship. What do you think you're gonna do when you get to heaven if you happen to get there? Huh? Give him a hand clap and a shout of praise. No praise? Somebody say no praise. No rain. Start playing a little something, would you? Remain standing with me. Say it again. No praise, praise. no rain. rain. Listen to what I'm going to say. Zechariah 14 and 17. It's the word of God. It's the word of God. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. No praise, no rain. Rain represents the Holy Spirit. No praise, no rain. Praise is like a cloud that forms in the atmosphere. Once enough of it accumulates, it drops rain. I shared a few weeks ago, I was mowing my front yard and man, I was, I was talking to the Lord. I was flying, man. I had that zero turn. It runs 13 mile an hour, 72 inches wide. And I was mowing some grass and I could see the rain coming from over around Pete Dye over on Meadowbrook Road. And I said, Lord, Lord, I was praying that it didn't rain. Now I'm praying that it does rain in a whole different way. And I've seen that rain coming down that valley. And before I could get back to the barn, man, there was big old drops of rain coming down out of the sky. And it, I, I, I was running from it, but it was hot. And when it hit me, I thought to myself, why am I running from it? And you just, at zero turn, it means it'll do this. And there I am, almost 60 years old, and I'm in the middle of a rain, and I thought, let's just kick it around one time. I just wish somebody that the rain would show up at Jewel City Church. Somebody get your zero turn in your feet and just zip it around one time and say, God, I need energized. God, I need filled up. God, I just come to give you praise. I just come to lift my hand. I just come to take them out of my pockets. Take them off of my chest. I just, can somebody lift your hand? Is anybody, can you lift your hands and bless? Has God been good to you? Can you praise him? Let everything that have breath praise ye the Lord. Give him a hand clap and a shout of praise. Woo! So here's the word. Here, here's what God instructs us to do. Not your pastor. Psalms 150 and 6, let everything that have breath praise the Lord, praise you the Lord. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I don't even know if you're alive. It's been a long time since I even seen you take a breath. Psalms 150 and 6, how can the message, Pastor Rita, be more clear? How can it be more clear? The writer was telling the individual listeners to praise the Lord. How can, how can, it, be, how can it be more clear? How can it be more clear? We are designed by God to praise Him. We are designed by God. Praise invites the Holy Spirit into our worship. And when the Holy Spirit comes in to our worship, the Holy Spirit will energize you. And I'm telling you, we're living in a world that wants to drain you. 
but we're living in a spiritual kingdom that wants to energize you. And all you got to do is make a choice and say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Give him a hand clap and a shout of praise. Somebody say this word. Somebody say expressions. Oh, that was pathetic. Someone say expressions. So here's what the word teaches us. There there are many expressions of praise to be found in the Bible. Psalms 134 and 2. And here's a good one because I can almost tell when new people come to church because they look around and they're like, these people are weird. They got their hands up. I had a lady, and she's probably here today. She was telling me about a friend of hers that said, I ain't going up there. She said, they lift their hands. We are designed by God to lift our hands. This is your cultural, denominational teaching. This is your bad theology. But the Word of God is clear. Listen to the Word of God in Psalms 134 and 2. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Lift up your hands. and Come on, I'll double dog dare you. Get your hands out of your pockets. Lift up your hands and bless the Lord. Lifting up our hands is scriptural and it's a unique expression of praise i love this i wish i'd have coined it but i didn't when you lift up your hands your fingerprints distinguish you from any other individual on the planet when you lift up your hands god and heaven when i lift up my hands They say there's Robert's fingerprints. That's Robert. That's Eric. That's Rita. That's Vern. That's Scotty. They know your DNA. They know your fingerprints. The FBI may have it on file, but God has had it from before time when he needed you in your mother's womb. And all this time, down through the generation, God is looking down, waiting to see your fingerprint. Somebody lift your hands up. Say, it's me. It's me, God. I come to praise you. I come to praise you. I ain't done. I ain't done. But start making your way like we normally close. Down around the front, up and down the aisles. Listen to me. The language, the language, the language of praise. Here's what the Lord revealed. Pastor Aaron said he sent me writing some new bread down. Generational blessings, generational curses. I've not lost the language of my forefathers. I can remember at the Enterprise United Methodist Church, my mom's mom with her feet all crippled, a gorder that big around her neck, and she had a language of praise. And I can remember her with that little hanky. And uh, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, start getting all over. Grandma's hanky start going like that. Next thing I knew, on the same row, Aunt Delcy, her belly start bouncing. She get in the spirit, and the handkerchief would start going, and then it'd jump down over on Sally Rose, and Sally would get all excited, and the older women, they had handkerchiefs, and one would say hallelujah, and the next one would say praise the Lord, and it was tangible, and it got all over, and it changed the atmosphere. I'm not asking you to get crazy. I'm not asking you to get like cereal Christians, fruit, flakes, and nuts. I'm asking you to do what God said and let everything have breath. Praise ye the Lord. Give me a shout. Grandma and Grandpa. Grandma and Grandpa taught me the language of praise. Even when I was sitting on the back row, sticking gum underneath the seats, Alan Hawkins leaned over the pew in front of me. I grab his underwear and give him the old Indian wedgie. But all 
the same time, the Word of God, I love it when stuff comes to my mind, doesn't go out in return void. And I'd watch all the saints and I'd think, man, they're half crazy. Well, can I tell you, half crazy is contagious. And it got on me. How did it get on me? Because it was given to my mom and dad from grandma and grandpa also. My dad could praise him. My mom could praise him in the house, in the church, in the car. That's why I am a praiser. I am a God chaser. I didn't come, hold on. I didn't come, I didn't come, I didn't come, I didn't come for no program. I didn't come to be entertained. I didn't come to patty cake it. I came to the house of the Lord to give him some praise. Thank you for listening to the Jewel City Podcast. 